I am so happy to be speaking to you because I think that of all the disciplines in a corporation, the folks who have been hit the hardest with complexity is probably the supply chain. Uh, just by a show of hands, uh, would you mind raising your hand if you've noticed just in the last five or 10 years, things have gotten noticeably more complex. Now be honest here. Now keep your hands up, look around the room, you can skip your therapy appointment this week. <laughs> it is not you. Trust me, it is not you. Uh, complexity, you know, we, we have a really strange relationship with technology. We don't seem to understand that it's adding to the complexity that we have. We're manufacturing complexity in picoseconds, and we're making new discoveries every minute of every day. According to Eric Schmidt, uh, the CEO of Google, we're generating as much information every two days, every 48 hours, as we did from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. That means you go to sleep Friday night, Monday morning, we've recreated that whole data set. Um, does anybody know what this is? This is the uh, chart that General McChrystal put up uh, in front of the press corps and the American public and said, when we understand this chart, uh, we win the campaign in Afghanistan. Uh, really, seriously, this is the immigration policy that is on the table now in our government. This is the Affordable Care Act. Now, okay, all right, you're laughing, but I had to look a long time to get a chart that would fit on one page, right? The Affordable Care Act, for example, is about, let's say, 370,000 words. The entire U.S. energy bill is 157,000 words. That, that's how fast things are growing. We are drowning in data options. And you're going to hear a lot of folks talk about the velocity of data, the volume that's coming at us. Remember, I go to sleep Friday night. I've created the entire database of human knowledge from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. The variety. According to IBM, 99% of our data is unstructured. And you, you folks know what unstructured means. It means unusable. There's no way to, con let's be honest, let's use the right language here. And then the veracity of data, and that's something we're gonna talk about in just a moment. But, but I am an evolutionary biologist, so we're, today, what I'm here to do is to talk about the really big picture. And when you think about the really big picture, biological change, evolution, the rate at which this uh, biological spacesuit that you and I are trapped in, President Obama's trapped in, all of us are trapped in, it frequently requires millions of years to adapt to create new features. So many years ago, I became fascinated with what happens when complexity races ahead of our brain's ability to really understand it. And it turns out that we can go back to the earliest uh, civilizations, the Mayan, the Khmer, the Egyptian, the Ming empires, and we can find that when complexity exceeds the cognitive, physiological cognitive capabilities we have, we become gridlocked. All the information in the world doesn't matter. We become unable to fix our problems, and they begin migrating from one generation to another, from one department to another from one vice president to another. Every civilization and organization eventually reaches a cognitive threshold. Why? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The rapid pace of change. Change is moving in picoseconds right now. And the slow pace of evolution. That uneven rate of change between simple biology and complexity causes a gap to occur. Now, a lot of you forgot biology. You, you, you know, you, you thought, well, I took a biology class just so I could graduate college. You know, so what, what does that have to do with my job on a day-to-day -day basis? So you might have forgotten that the last time that we had a huge jump in human physiology was when we stood upright. Suddenly, we could see our enemies further away. We could smell them. And we knew that this was, this provided some survival advantage, but we didn't have any way to process it in our brains. We didn't have the frontal cortex.
The prefrontal cortex is in the front of your head. It's about a third of your brain. And it took about three to, well, I'm going to say three to five million years to develop. It's the CEO of your brain. It's all, it's the part of your brain that's learning today and is going to take all this information that, you're, that ma makes your head want to explode over the next couple of days. Uh, but go back and now apply it. But in evolutionary terms, four to five million years is what we call fast evolution. So now let's compare this to what goes on in the technology world. When organizations are young, problems are really simple and they're easily managed by the right and left part of our brain and the skill sets that we have. But over time, our problems become more complex. And in a complex scenario, the number of wrong choices exceeds the number of right ones. And we enter a high failure rate environment. The best definition, by the way, don't ever go out and buy a book on complexity. Why? It's too complex. It, 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 it's, they're, they're difficult to understand. The best definition of complexity comes out of Harvard University. It's a simple one to remember. There are more wrong choices than there are right ones. And the number of wrong ones is exponentiating. Faster than you can get, than you can analyze them, faster than you can even process the information. For example, our US tax code is now about 75,000 pages. It went from 73,950 to 75,000 in the time that uh, I didn't have time to go back and change my slides. Uh, I've gone all around the country and asked people, how many of you have read your credit card terms? It's about 20,000 words. You probably have more than one credit card. It's about 20,000 words. I, I like to count things. People will get really annoyed at me. I go to restaurants and count the number of items on the menu. You don't want to invite me out to go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> because I'm, I'm constantly counting because it's just an overwhelm. Now, in the supply chain challenge, your big issue when you really try to look at the big picture is change management. It's too complex. Let's be honest about this. There are too many variables. The problems you're solving look more like the problems that physicists deal with that, are, that require chaotic models and very high rates of failure. All of the variables are, are, you know, are behaving dynamically, which means that when one variable changes 0.00001%, all the other millions of variables change. And that's what cha chaotic models do in the, in the actual physical universe. Also, you have an issue with speed of execution and implementation. It's accelerating. How often does someone, or you go into a meeting and someone says, hey, did you read this article? Did you hear about this software? Did you hear about this hardware? And you're sort of left dumbfounded, <laughs> like, I should know, but let me remind you, we recreated the entire universe of, of human knowledge this weekend. I'm catching up. It is unclear how to plan for uncertainty. And uncertainty is all you have in a high failure rate environment. And then there's the almighty internal resistance to change the educating, the politics that goes on, the hippo, the highest paid person in the room's opinion all play a, a factor. So how many times do you go into it, you're loaded up with all of this empirical data, all these facts, all these spreadsheets, and you think, why aren't they listening to me? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Complexity makes knowledge and facts very difficult to discern and to acquire. Instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, which is already a daunting exercise, we're looking for a specific needle in a stack of needles now. And this is something that your human brain and my human brain is simply not designed to do, not at this point in time. So when complexity makes knowledge difficult to attain, what do we do? Well, we only have two baskets, empirical rational data or, or opinions and unproven beliefs. 
And we have unproven beliefs about a lot of things. For example, uh, Dr. Oz says, raspberry ketones, eat a lot of them and you'll lose 20 pounds this week. And then we can't stock enough raspberry ketones. We all make a mad dash down there and we think that we're gonna, we won't have to exercise, we'll just eat raspberry ketones and lose weight. We have, uh, we have uh, unproven beliefs about the climate change. We, uh, we have now 1.5 billion, with a B, readings of the Earth's surface temperature and the temperature is going up. But 65% of Americans do not believe that that is the case. So uh, one and a half billion is not enough. Maybe it takes two billion readings or, or global burning. Uh, uh. What, what is a belief? A belief is very cognitively easy. You don't have to work on a belief. You simply believe it or you don't. It's uh, unproven. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. By the way, when you can't uh, provide any empirical data for a decision, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just simply means it's unproven. Most companies don't allow for we don't know. We think this might be the case. There's no allowance for that. You have to argue as though you have empirical data, and sometimes you just simply don't. And by the way, we have beliefs that are large and small. When the light turns green, you think it's safe to cross the crosswalk. In New York, by the way, the new, real New Yorkers don't even wait for the light to turn green, right? But, but me, I, I'm tempted to wait till every car comes to a stop in New York <laughs> based on how my cab driver drives. Uh, um, um, but you have uh, beliefs about a lot of things. You're, you're, you need beliefs to simply function. The human organism uh, it relies on both beliefs, and also we are vigorous pursuers of fact. That's what you're here today for, is you are the vigorous pursuers of fact. But many times we don't let facts get in the way. Let's say, face it, folks. We, we practiced bloodletting for 200 years despite the fact the patients were dying. Right? Uh, we didn't let that get in the way. Bleed them more. And, we've, and I have a lot of scientific brethren who say, hey, I, you know, I don't base any of my decisions on beliefs. Uh, you're, you're mistaken, Rebecca. And I go, well, what do you call a hypothesis? What do you call a theory? Uh, it, if you're in the science field, you know that it is very difficult to prove a fact. It's a very intensive process. And it, has to, it, it, it takes a long time, uh, and there are certain processes that we have to follow in order to get good and valid data. One of the things we've discovered over time is that civilizations and your organizations thrive when there's an accommodation for fact-based decisions as well as opinions and belief-based decisions. But there comes a point when beliefs begin to dominate and overshadow knowledge, and knowledge takes a back seat and we become susceptible to unproven claims and also to following false prophets, particularly those that are charismatic. Does anybody know who this is on the left-hand side? Yeah, Bernie Madoff. By the way, the people who turned their money over to Bernie Madoff weren't small-time investors. These were people that had been in the market for you know, decades. So what would cause someone like Steven Spielberg to turn over massive amounts of money to Bernie Madoff? Well, Bernie Madoff said, hey, listen, I could explain it to you, but the financial market's just too complex. But here you can see all these people I made money for. And so how often, I, look, I have to go see my financial advisor once a year, and it's one of the most painful experiences that I have to go through once a year because I'm sitting there and he's talking endlessly about how I have to plan for my retirement. He's talking about all these different vehicles, and I'm nodding my head as though I understand what he's talking about. And I'm telling you, I don't. I hope he doesn't watch this video <laughs> or he's going to send me to school. Over time, decisions and policies, they get based on irrational beliefs rather than knowledge or fact. And when that occurs, the third step, which is collapse, unilateral collapse, is not far behind. What I'm here to tell you is we know the earliest signs of failure, unilateral failure. And we didn't know them before. And that's why I think my book has been published in 26 uh, countries and has been in the top 1% of uh, Amazon sales for four straight years in a row. 
we, are, we have to look for earlier signs so that we can stop being reactive. Now, I'm going to use an example of this process of what those early signs are that won't be political. I find that no matter what I choose nowadays, somebody says, oh, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. You can't pick a social issue without being marginalized immediately. So I've decided to pick one that I think is safe. Maybe the Mayans are safe. They were a while back, right? So for 3,000 years, the Mayans knew that they had a tenuous relationship with rainfall. They knew if it didn't rain, that they wouldn't be able to grow crops and that their civilization would go into decline. So many people, when they go down to see the Mayan ruins, they go to see the big pyramids that the Mayans uh, built. But even more interesting were that they were master hydraulic engineers. They built reservoirs that were unprecedented for their time. They also uh, dug out underground cisterns so that the water wouldn't evaporate. And those were the first refrigeration systems. They put food in there so that it wouldn't spoil because it was cool inside the cisterns. And they practiced water conservation, uh, crop rotation. I mean, they were very sophisticated food growers. And so for the first 2,000 years or so, you see that the, and by the way, this is true of all civilizations. I cover in my book the Romans, the Khmer Empire, very similar uh, patterns of behavior. The first 2,000 years, you see them developing these reservoirs, building these cisterns, practicing water conservation, and also in tandem, they're sacrificing and practicing fetishism. Uh, when they conquer a, a, a new tribe, uh, they take the tribe in as slaves and they begin, began sacrificing them. So there was an accommodation for man-made, empirically based uh, remedy and also for unproven beliefs. But during the last 1,000 years, as the drought began to become more and more severe, you see them stop building reservoirs. No more cisterns. No more, no more water conservation. They begin escalating fetishism. First, it is captured slaves. They increase the numbers that they, that they sacrifice. Then they move on to their own people. Uh, they move on to the old and the infirm. Then young virgins. And uh, just before the collapse of the Mayan Empire, we see that they are sacrificing unspoiled newborn infants. And for hundreds of years, they followed no man-made remedies, no rational remedies. They turned entirely toward beliefs to solve drought conditions. Now, I have people say to me, well, Rebecca, we're not doing that, you know. I mean, we're not sacrificing babies. No, we have people in the world who believe flying planes into buildings is a remedy for their conditions, is a solution. To me, as, a, as an evolutionary biologist, not all that different. So what we know today is that there's a reoccurring spiral. The first sign that complexity is outpacing our cognitive abilities is gridlock. Then we move on to having a mass confusion. By the way, I have a radio program, and I have to tell you, all you have to do is listen to talk radio. Any of you listen to talk radio? Raise your hand. You want to know about a mass confusion between facts and fiction? Just turn on any talk radio program. It's the reason that I went on talk radio is because I wanted to try to take people on a journey with me to get down to some facts as opposed to hours and hours of opinions. The third is that your policy, internal policy, becomes irrational. It's based on, on unproven beliefs, and then decline and uh, collapse ensue. According to E.O. Wilson, who is the greatest naturalist in the world out of Harvard University, we live at a time when we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. You think we might have a challenge here in this room? But a cognitive threshold is not the only evolutionary obstacle that we face today. We're not born blank slates. Uh, I know that when many of you were, uh, were children, you were told you're born a blank slate and your teacher writes on the slate, your parents write on the slate, and your friends write on the slate, and then that's who you miraculously become. But somehow, <laughs> when that myth was perpetuated, we completely forgot about anything you inherited from your ancestors, your earlier ancestors. We, gave, we made no allowance for any genetic predispositions. We know better now. For example, um, I 
have been struggling with a weight problem all my life. Some of you can relate to this. I am an educated woman. If you put a buffet out and you have some carrots and some, some celery and you have some glazed donuts, my brain says eat the salad and my hand is going for that glazed donut. You uh, Get out of my way. I want it. Now, I should never eat a glazed donut again the rest of my life, nor should I eat a hot dog. There are lots of things I know logically, but I'm predisposed, and I got to thinking about this. Why me, an educated woman who has a lot of control over her life, what is my problem? What is Oprah's problem? And I realized, <laughs> well, well, Oprah's got the same problem. She's a powerful woman. Why can't she stop eating? <laughs> but here's what I realized. I realized that I am the descendant of ancestors who were very good at identifying high calories and consuming them. Now, we're laughing about it, but calories are very difficult to obtain in nature. When you think about it, in earlier times, to, uh, I had to climb to the top of a tree to get an apple, and that was, I burned more calories to get the apple than consuming the apple, you know, ever, ever would give me. But it's not me. It's, it's the environment that's changed. Now, there's a Starbucks with a donut waiting on every corner for me, right? But not only that, I've also discovered my ancestors were very good at staying still and not moving around unless they had to go look for more calories or fight off their enemies. And apparently, I'm not the only one. <laughs> there are lots of my tribe around. The, the, the point is, there's a lot of irrational behavior going on inside your companies. Territoriality, for example. Now, recently I had a CEO of a company come up and he said, Rebecca, great presentation. I had a lot of fun listening to you and relating to you. But we don't have, I don't really think I'm driven by any genetic predispositions. I don't have those behavioral problems. And I thought about it for a moment. He was a very powerful man. I was a little intimidated, actually. And I thought about it for a moment, and then I said, do you go shopping at the grocery store? And he said, yes, I do. I do. And I said, well, would you do a little experiment with me? He said, sure. I said, next time you go to a grocery store, I don't want you to waste all your time going up and down the aisles looking for what you need. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your cart, and I want you to go straight to the checkout stand where everybody's in line to pay for their stuff and shop out of their carts. He said, what? And I said, they haven't paid for it. They, it doesn't belong to them. They have everything you want, milk, bread, all cereal, it's all in their carts. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to do I said, why? You're not doing anything. They haven't paid for it. It doesn't belong to them. Just go straight to the checkout aisle, shop out of other people's carts. You'll be out of there in a couple of seconds. He said, they'll, they'll, they'll fight me. They'll call, the, they'll call the manager. And I said, yes, they will. Because in, in primitive times, a territory contained all the food and water you needed to survive. And in modern times, that cart, you cut. Have you ever been in the grocery store or somewhere where someone's gone over and mistaken your cart? You're ready to go into fisticuffs. <laughs> hey, 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 that's my cart. No, not really. The cart belongs to the store. So does all the food. You didn't pay for it. But that became your territory. And you will fight, by the way, because we, we sociobiologists like to do little experiments. You will fight. So how does that translate? Well, it translates into man-to-man -man coverage, right? I will protect a territory, or I will protect the people that I care about. And so then how does that translate out of sports? It translates into Rudy Giuliani cleaning up Times Square by putting a beat cop on every block. Previously, they didn't, the, the police didn't know who they were protecting. You are only designed by nature to protect people that you care about or a physical territory. You will not protect anything else, even if you're law enforcement. So I'm working now with the uh, police department in Salinas, California, where they have a massive gang problem. 
and we now have to put someone on every block, and when they check in, they go to each house, they knock on the door and say, I'm here and I'm on duty. And you know what's happened? The people come out and bring them coffee. Oh, it's my daughter's birthday Saturday. She's going to turn seven. They've developed a connection. And in those areas where we assigned police officers specific territories and made them get to know the people they were going to protect, crime is completely gone. Gang, the gangs have moved out of those neighborhoods. They can't win. The attachment now is with the police officer. Now, one thing I want to remind you is that your biological response, this body, this spacesuit that you're uh, tied into, is only designed for short-term danger, which is why all of you who are in this room and are preemptors and would like to keep your companies from getting into trouble, no one will listen to you. Because if I take a snake and I throw it into this room, you're all going to jump back, automatic reflex, fight or flight. But when we put a cuff on someone and we sit them in a room and we show them pictures of what the effects of climate change are, their heart, our heartbeat doesn't even go up one beat an hour. We have no physiological response to long-term danger. So that's why when you talk to your 21-year-old or your 25-year-old and you say, you need to save money, or social security is going to go away, their eyes sort of roll up in the back of their head. There is no physiological response to long-term threats. That's why preemption is so difficult, because you're fighting physio human physiology. And so planning suffers. We, this guy, I love this guy. We usually do our long-range planning at the last minute. But if the gap between rapid progress and slow evolution is the problem, then how do we break that cycle? Because you can probably tell I'm not a gloom and doom type of person. And I didn't want to write a book that was, hey, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Nothing we can do about it. Didn't seem like a good idea. Now, here's the good news. We have broken down the human genome. We didn't know this before. And we have about a less than a 5% difference in our genetic material from a bonobo monkey. Now, I think you will agree with me. We have leveraged the heck out of that 5%. But, the, but it's not, here it, it's not uh, quantity, it's quality. That 5% is our ability to reason. It's that frontal cortex that makes all the difference. And the reason that you're here today is because the highest instrument that took millions of years to bring you here in this room, right, the highest instrument of your evolutionary inheritance is your ability to do thought experiments, to pre-mortem things, to say, if it would fail and the patient were going to die, why would the patient die, right? To look ahead. And if you think about it, there's no greater evolutionary asset than the ability to look ahead, know that danger's coming, and then take an action in the present to completely circumvent it or at the very least, to minimize it. So there are two antidotes for growing complexity. Strategy and technology, which I'm going to talk about, and also physical adaptation. I want to talk about what your brains are going through and how they're going to change in the future. Now, I mentioned the, the uh, definition of complexity that comes out of Harvard. Uh, this is Dr. Yanir Baryam, who says, a complex environment demands picking the right choice. But remember now, there are more wrong choices than there are right ones. So complexity causes us to become bad pickers over time. And through trial and error, we run out the clock, and then suddenly we're in that reactive mode. You could take the Gulf oil spill, for example, where we tried to solve the problem using a linear approach. It doesn't work when complexity is exponentiating. Uh, I think you all remember those mushroom clouds that every night we were watching on the news that were coming uh, up to the surface. It was interesting that the first thing we did is, uh, you probably remember this, we decided we were going to drop a concrete box on the hole, uh, and then we, said we thought that was going to take care of it, and then about 30 days later we said, no, that didn't work. And then we decided we were going to uh, drill and siphon the, the, some of the oil capture it below the surface so it didn't come up to the surface and re relieve it. And we waited about 30 days, and that didn't work. And then the third solution we came up with was static kill. And fortunately, that worked. But now imagine if that had been solution number 180. 
we'd still be watching these, these Hiroshima-looking mushroom clouds of oil come to the surface in the Gulf. Now, when we're faced with complexity, and it is a mission-critical, time-sensitive issue, what kind of mitigation will work? Well, we have uh, models. This is the good news. We have models for high failure rate environments. Venture capital, for example, that many of you are familiar with. Venture capitalists invest in 100 companies, sometimes many in one uh, single sector that compete against each other, and they only expect maybe 10 or 15 to do well. How can you create such a successful business out of a 10 or 15 percent hit rate. You might be asking yourself that. I don't ask myself that because I happen to live in California, near where all those very rich venture capitalists live. They're very successful. And the reason is because they stage their investment. And they understand they're in a high failure rate environment. And no matter what they do on the front end, no matter how much due diligence they do to try to call the right solutions from the wrong ones, they won't, they won't get it. They know that they can't. Now, I'm going to give you an example to contrast against the Gulf oil spill, the rescue of the Chilean miners. Do you, raise your hand if you remember watching that, that rescue. At the time that the Chilean, same problem as the Gulf oil spill, mission critical, time sensitive, huge downside. And the problem is exponentiating. Too many variables to get your arms around, what are you going to do? But the Chilean government took a different approach. They executed 16 rescue plans in tandem. They knew, like venture capitalists, that no amount of due diligence was going to let them call the right approach on the front end. So what they did was they said, we'll take all and any suggestions and start marching forward. And 16 turned to 15. And 15 turned to 14. Because as they gathered more empirical data, they realized certain rescue plans were not going to work. They, they, it, based on empirical data, it wasn't. Now, you know that all, all the miners were successfully rescued by using that approach. And when they rescued all those miners, they were still implementing three plans in tandem, and they were crowdsourcing from all over the world. There were geologists from California there. There were, there were engineers from Germany. Everybody came in, and, they, and everybody was welcome to give their opinion. Many people say to me, yes, but we can't execute six or 10 or 12 solutions at one time when we have a problem. Yes, you can. You just think you can't. In your mind, you think it means more funding. It's not more money. It's how you spend the money. If you start out with 10 solutions, instead of sitting in a conference room and arguing over who is going to get funded and who has the right solution based on unproven beliefs, rather than do that, pick four or five solutions that look good and fund them through a short period of time, first round funding. If they, prove they don't produce any empirical uh, evidence that they're going to succeed, they don't get second round of funding. The actual mass or volume of capital you will invest will be exactly the same. The only difference is on the back end, you will have picked a solution that works. And I want to uh, make a little sidebar here. I want to remind you that in nature, because what you're dealing with in every day is an ecosystem. That's how I describe companies. Companies are ecosystems, and they abide by the same rules that ecosystems in nature abide by. You don't have different rules. You might think you, might, you use different vocabulary, but the actual fundamentals are not different. In nature, any drive towards singularity is a drive toward extinction. If you take nothing away from my talk today, take this away. Because as you drive toward efficiency, I have noticed more and more companies, as they begin to cut and cut and cut to the bone, there is an internal confusion between waste and necessary redundancy. The things you don't use and you don't think you need are not necessarily wasteful. They may be necessary for when there's a mission-critical, rare catastrophe, but that catastrophe will do you in. There are eight technologies. I'm not going to have a lot of time today to go into each of these. And 
the speaker that is following me, do come back. He's got props. He's got cool gadgets, and you're really, he's going to knock your socks off. So, and he's going to go into a lot of the new technologies that will be affecting a supply chain management. But I'm going to talk about these very, very briefly. There are eight technologies which I suggest to you will have a huge impact on supply chain management. Analytics and big data, most of you are aware of that. You're already working on that. If you have that much data and you have to try to process it to get a solution or a response today, there is no way the human brain can do that. You have to have some powerful data analytics. Cloud computing, mobile apps, 3D printing, you've all seen the videos of 3D uh, plastic toys being produced. Uh, there's a video on YouTube of a guy making a gun up in Canada that shoots six bullets. Took him, uh, I think he used a 3D printer that was $3,500 and took him about an hour. Um, surveillance, you're going to be talking about that in the speaker that, uh, that follows me. Alternative energies. Robots, nanobots, nanotechnology is going to have a huge impact on, on supply uh, chain management, and also neuroscience. So what, what about analytics and big data? They're, you're going to be in some workshops today that will go into this uh, in a lot more detail than I am, but it allows you to essentially evaluate a broader uh, range of scenarios in lickety-split time. And we are moving toward computer-assisted decision-making um, instead of relying on unproven beliefs simply because our brains are not designed to process the information. And it allows us to make much more accurate predictions of future events so that we can preempt negative outcomes. And remember, that is your greatest evolutionary inheritance, your ability to avoid a negative outcome if you so choose to do it. We're not doing such a good job with that right now. Right now, we're, we're using the lower instruments of our genetic inheritance, such as reacting to a snake in the room. But I know that you want to get on top of things, and in order to get on top of things, sometimes we have to talk to our executive management team and make them aware we only have a 5% genetic difference from a bonobo monkey, and we're acting a lot like monkeys. Sometimes we just have to say what it is. Um, again, if you're trying to look for a needle in a stack of needles, how can you do that? Well, unless there's powerful analytic algorithms, you can't. That's the truth. You can't process the amount of data that we're generating, particularly if 99% of it's unstructured. So you have to have some mechanism to do that. I want to talk to you for just a second about how big data systems are being used in an ER, for example. Now, in an ER, you have a mission-critical, time-sensitive decision that has to be made. Similar, I would argue, to supply chain decisions that have to be made on the spot. And so this presents a big problem, because when you're rolled into the ER, the person's never seen you, doesn't know your background, and whoever you might get the best surgeon in the hospital, or you might get somebody who is just an intern, who's now going to take you in and determine whether you live or die. So there are big data systems, for example, at Sloan Ketterling, where it doesn't matter now who takes you in. They simply go in, they type in all of the symptoms that are known about you, and Watson surveys the entire universe of medical information that's available in the world and comes back and says, it's 64% that you have this, 29% this, 11% this, but here's where Watson really delivers. He comes back and he says, but if you got me this data, this data, and this data about the patient, my diagnosis would improve 49%. He provides a pointer to the person who takes you in as to what data is most important to get next and, and, and then after that. Now, why is that important? It's important because let's use Dole Fresh Foods as an example. Dole Fresh Foods is, is a client of mine that I'm working with, largest producer of food in the world. It was interesting that after the first couple of meetings with the executives there, I said, you have an emergency room. They said, what? And they thought, she must not understand. We're in agriculture. I said, no, you're actually not in agriculture. You're, if you look at your supply chain problem, you have an emergency room problem. The minute you cut a head of lettuce, it's dying. 
It's dying. Now it's a race to save the head of lettuce and get it to the grocery store so someone can consume it before it dies. And they said, we don't use those words. <laughs> Again, vocabulary difference here. But they should have used those words. It's interesting that Dole has had a complete change. I, I'm not going to be able to go into this because I seriously am going to run out of time. But I will tell you that Dole has had a complete change of culture since they decided they were an emergency room uh, supplier. And they're using big data analytics now to, that are tied to NASA, meteorological data, that lets them know when rainfall is coming so that a farmer out in Guatemala, up on a hill, can take his mobile phone, type in, have access to the NASA meteorological data, have it analyzed for him, and get a little note that says you can cut your watering back today by 83% because rain is on its way. How cool is that? It's reducing water usage in California by 8% since that, since that hookup. I'm not going to talk much about cloud computing because most of you are familiar with that and they're running some workshops here. Again, go anywhere mobile apps have to be tied to those complex back-end analytics. Uh, otherwise, they don't work. And Dole is a classic example of that. They're, they're growing food all around the world. Uh, so when that farmer in Guatemala, all he has is a cell phone. He doesn't need to know there's a big data system on the back end of that. 3D printing. Oops, let's go back. Have, ha, how many of you have seen 3D printing demonstrations? OK, so it blows your mind. I saw these shoes made on a 3D printer. So the minute you can make custom shoes, custom clothes, custom toys, and everything from your home, distribution completely changes. Now you're distributing materials, and you're distributing schematics. And so things begin to change very, very radically. Surveillance, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because the, the speaker following me is going to cover some of the surveillance things. But how much and how far? How much do we need to know about the consumer? How much do we need to know where the product is going, how it will be used? What are our responsibilities? Um, you know, this borders on some ethical and moral questions, and I know you know that our government is, is uh, dealing with this right now as well. So we, we, we're going to have to. Alternative energies, of course, you're, you're all on top of this. You're all aware of it. I interviewed T. Boone Pickens uh, a couple of months ago. And he's had the pick and plan, Pickens plan in front of the US government for, I think it's like 10 years now. I think it's, it's going to celebrate its decade old uh, anniversary. Simply move, transfer, uh, transitioning 8 million 18 uh, wheeler trucks right, to natural gas will allow us to com almost completely eliminate buying even one more gallon of OPEC oil. So what you're doing, I would suggest, is a ma so when you go home, you're talking to your wives or husbands, you tell them what you're doing is a matter of national security. And see, see if, they, uh, see if they, they're nicer to you. Might work. Uh, this is part of the, T Boone, uh, the Pickens plan. Robotics is going to play a big role. Uh, we are now at a point where we have nanobots that are approximately the size of a human cell. Do you know that? They look like that. Uh, we're now injecting them into uh, Norwegian rats. And the nanobots are uh, programmed to eliminate cancer cells so that you won't be taking pharmaceuticals anymore. At Dole, uh, we're running an experimental program where we're spraying plants with nanobots in lieu of pesticides. The nanobots then are ingested into the plant. And then that particular plant that has that particular nanobot is telling us how much water that plant needs and what nutrition it needs to provide the greatest yield. The world belongs to nanobots. We'll be ingesting them, and then we'll be spitting them out. I know it freaks some people out. Does it freak you out? I would rather have a nanobot than eat a piece of dirt that's 100 times larger. These are very, very small. They'll pass through your system. I actually was speaking at, <laughs> they will. They're just going to pass through. You won't even know it. We shouldn't even tell you. Forget labeling. There are things we should not know. 
Uh, but here's the most important thing. You're living in the golden age of neuroscience. Um, we used to think that uh, you know, all of the decisions were made on the left and the right side of the brain. But if you think about it, it's the first time we can put a skull cap on your head and administer increasingly complex problems and then look at what your brain does when you're on overload, when you simply can't make a decision. And we've discovered there's a third form of problem solving that is actually evolving in the human brain. And we, we, call, we tend to call these aha moments. And we made folklore out of them. Uh, Archimedes sat in the tub and the water spilled over and, and he discovered displacement theory. Newton sat under a, a, a tree and an apple hit him in the head and he discovered gravity. Uh, we kind of thought these were like these genius moments that happened. But oh no, no, it's actually an identifiable cognitive process in the human brain. What we find is, is that there's a third form of problem solving that's ideally matched to complex problems. It's called insight. And what insight is, is it's when you take two pieces of data that you've never connected before and didn't even think were related, and suddenly, boom, in a flash of lightning, you connect the two and you have a brilliant solution. I know you've all experienced this because it's, it's, part of, it's part of the human function, where you'll be sitting in a room and everyone's talking about a problem, and all of a sudden you say, I know, why don't we just do this? And everyone turns around and says, how'd you come up with that? And here's one of the traits of insight. The solution arrives immediately, and you don't have a process. It's not like the left side of your brain where you start out with this many options, and you work down and work down and get to one or two, and then you pick one. Or the, the, uh, the right side of your brain where you just, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you, and I see a little sweat on the top of your lip, and I know you're lying to me. By the way, you are all excellent liar detectors because lying posed a, a threat to our survival in earlier times. So you, if you have a gut feel someone's lying to you, 99.9% .9 it's right. You do have that liar detector. I'm not going to go through the physical... Uh, evidence, but I will tell you that in labs, we can now predict 300 milliseconds before you're going to use insight to solve a highly complex problem that's above your pay grade. And the way we can predict it is a small part of your brain called the ASTG lights up like a Christmas tree. And if you're a science geek like I am, when you get to a point where you can predict an event's going to happen, you're on to something. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to do everything to induce insight. What are the conditions that will allow you to short circuit the left and right side of the brain and be able to connect data? Now, listen, I gotta tell you, if, you don't, if you've never taken a physics class, you're not gonna come up with something. It's completely dependent on content. My kids tried to say, Mom, I'll have insight, and I said, yeah, it doesn't work that way. You have to have the content. You know, you have to have the content to connect. So you still need education and you need help with content loading. And that's where neuroscientists are having many breakthroughs in, uh, in brain fitness. Uh, there, if, if you've got a pen out, write Posit Science, P-O-S-I-T. Great site uh, by neuroscientist Mike Mersnick. We're discovering that in order to load content, your brain wants to be warmed up. If you've got a difficult decision, don't try to, hit, to cold start your brain. And if you think about it, you wouldn't run a marathon without hydrating, working out, warming up as well. Your brain wants to be warmed up as well. And, and these brain fitness tools warm up all sides of your brain, and they allow you to absorb content easier. We've now put them in schools in Jacksonville uh, County, in Oakland, California. Now observe children uh, starting the school day with brain fitness, warming their brain up in the morning, just 10 or 15 minutes before they go to do the rest of their school day, complete the rest of their school day. No change in curriculum, no change in teachers, no change in classrooms or computers. These children now have three times the academic achievement of kids who did not warm their brains up. So if there's one thing you can do for your company, convince everybody to start using uh, brain fitness tools. But here's the good news. It is the first time that the President of the United States has allocated money to map the human brain. And what's exciting about this is you know what, what mapping the human genome has done to medicine. Well, you get ready, because if you're not looking into neuroscience right now, you should be. It's going to affect the way we do absolutely everything, from education to managing companies to retaining employees to how we make decisions in the future. 
So in conclusion, more data, more people, more ways. We now know the earlier symptoms of collapse. A thriving, in a thriving society, the left and the right brain are solving the major problems that we have. Knowledge and beliefs coexist. Then we hit a cognitive threshold. Problems persist, they grow larger, they're more dangerous. Beliefs replace knowledge and super memes appear. I'm not gonna go into super memes today, but I cover five major super memes that are obstacles to progress in every company. And I hope you'll take a moment to, to look at those. There's five different chapters in the book. And then we collapse and we regenerate. Collapse does not mean we die. Here's a new definition of collapse for everyone to use. Collapse simply means a reversion to systems that your brain was designed to handle. If the financial system around the world collapses, we will revert to barter. You and I will meet in the road, I will have some uh, chickens, and you will have some wheat, and we will argue until we make a trade that we both feel good about. That is what our brains can handle today. What it can handle is credit default swaps, yes? So the top attributes of high-performing companies are fast adaptation, strategic, as in venture capital models, tactical and technological, a mix of empirically-based and belief-based policy. But you know what's really nice? It's really nice to sit around a table with people and say, all right, we're making this decision, but we're making it on very few facts. Everybody agree? Yeah. So we should actually come back here in three days and see if there are any new facts which would cause us to change the decision. It really opens it up. It allows us to fail. And my advice to you is fail often, fail fast. <laughs> it will cost you less money, and you're, you're on the road to the right solution. Diversification and redundancy, remember again, any drive toward singularity, toward a single process, toward a single technology, toward a single anything, is a drive toward extinction. In nature, an insect that decides it's only gonna eat one plant and survive on one plant is doomed, right? That's a dead insect and it doesn't know it. And to become a predictive and preemptive organization, to understand that everything in your body and the bodies of your executive teams are saying react, 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 react. And, and that is not calling on the highest instrument of your genetic inheritance. So if I, I am going to recommend my favorite movie on adaptation to you. How many of you have seen Moneyball? Best movie, make everyone in your company watch Moneyball, right? If you wanna know the difference between a industry that was driven by superstition and unproven beliefs and how empirical fact revolutionized that industry. Watch Moneyball, it, baseball was completely changed by that. This is Billy Bean, and he said it, so I'm gonna say it, adapt or die. Okay, I'll be outside to answer your questions, and thank you all for being here, and have a great day.